Comet C-2021 A1 Leonard shows promise to grace our morning skies in early December and evening skies in late December 2021. Will it outperform expectations or just be another dud? Comets are fickle creatures. I've got a couple of videos on how a hyped up comet can and sometimes does fail us patient comet watchers. Links will be at the end of this video. I was hooked by Hyakutake and Hale-Bopp back when $1,000 digital cameras had floppy disk drives. I'm Michael, an amateur astrophotographer that has captured, or just watched, bright comets for years. Comets are one of my favorite astro targets, and I get really hyped when I think one might become especially photogenic. I've gleaned every detail I can looking at the orbit and star charts for Comet Leonard, and now I can help you Make the most of your Comet Leonard experience this December, wherever you are on planet Earth. Let's talk about Leonard's path around the sun. That'll help us make sense of why Leonard will look the way it will and why you'll be seeing it at different times and places at night, depending on when in the month of December you are looking. And Leonard is a bit of a complex one. Comet Leonard was discovered at the very beginning of 2021. At that point, it was already closer to the sun than Mars, but high above our solar system's orbital plane. If you are standing on the northern hemisphere, the comet is basically above you. For much of 2021, you could find Leonard in Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. But since its discovery, it has been very dim. That's changing quickly, however. Leonard has a highly eccentric orbit, like most comets. In this case, coming from 3,700 astronomical units away above the solar system. This is extremely far. Take the distance to the phone in your hands, and imagine that's the enormous distance Earth is from the sun. Set it down, then walk about one mile away from it. And then insert bad jokes about how impossible for you that is. At this distance, Comet Leonard's aphelion, it only feels a tiny bit of the sun's gravity, barely in orbit and moving relative to the sun at around 15 meters per second. The Earth orbits the sun at 30,000 meters per second by comparison. Even the slightest adjustment to Leonard's orbit could have an enormous impact on how it orbits the sun. Leonard will cross the orbital plane of the planets very, very close to Venus, right between the Earth and the sun, but it won't hit Venus. However, dust from the tail could cause a pretty crazy meteor storm there. And while the comet will appear to grow to enormous sizes relative to our solar system's planets, most of that material is really spread out dust and gas. And those enormous sizes you might see touted on websites and TV are just doing a poor job attempting to add context to something that doesn't really need it or just to sound really hype. Remember, these are the same people who say longest partial blood red wolf supermoon lunar eclipse in 600 years. It's just a lunar eclipse. However big the comet's tail gets, still, the mass of that comet nucleus is tiny. A common cliched comparison would be a good-sized mountain, but that is actually much better context. In other words, this comet, like nearly all comets, won't cause disruption in any meaningful way to the solar system. Venus will be far more devastating to Leonard, however. While Venus would only just barely notice Leonard's little mountain-sized tug of gravity, all it will take is that small change in velocity passing by Venus to send Leonard on a permanent course out of the solar system for the rest of time. So interestingly, while Leonard, inbound, has a highly eccentric orbit, outbound from the solar system, it will have a hyperbolic interstellar trajectory, perhaps fleeing the comet toward an encounter with another star in the very distant future. After the Venus flyby, Leonard spends time rounding the sun below the plane of the solar system and therefore above and in the direction of the sun for people in the southern hemisphere for a bit of time. Leonard then is getting further away from the Earth, but a bit closer to the sun until its closest approach on January 1st. This should keep the comet pretty bright for several days in late December, but I'll cover its brightness in a bit. Later, as the comet dims once again, it'll come back around and above the plane of the solar system and head out into interstellar space. Leonard's orbit does some interesting things for us here on Earth as we watch the encounter evolve. At first, Leonard will favor the northern hemisphere. Then, as it approaches the sun, it will only be visible before dawn, or in some cases after dusk, rising over the eastern horizon before the sun does. Next, Leonard begins to swing around and over the western side of the sun, becoming an evening object. Just after sunset in the northern hemisphere, and becoming visible in the evening after sunset as well in the southern hemisphere a few days later. During these few days in mid-December, Leonard is visible to virtually anyone on Earth except for the extreme far north where Earth's tilt points you away from the sun, and therefore the comet rounding by it. And of course it's not going to be good down in the Antarctic summer where the sun isn't setting at all this time of year. During this time, the encounter with Venus will happen. The close approach to Venus will be visible from Earth, looking much like this. There might be a time between the 15th and 17th when Venus may appear to be inside of the comet's tail, if it performs well enough. 
Around this time as well, Leonard may take on a fan shape, much like Panstars did a few years ago, perhaps even appearing to have an anti-tail from Earth's perspective. So how bright will Leonard get? I've been watching measurements and light curve estimates daily for a few weeks. While the original estimates from a few months ago had Leonard prog to reach no higher than about fourth magnitude, or about as bright as the middle stars in the Little Dipper, this would not be terribly impressive. And given how often twilight and low horizon views Leonard will have to fight with to be visible to you, this wouldn't even be a comet I'd talk about on this channel. Instead, observations have, for a good while now, beaten estimates pretty consistently. As a result, light forecasts are putting Leonard at more like magnitude two to three, or about as bright as the stars in the Big Dipper. If Leonard can hold it together and continue to brighten at its current pace, this would make it an easy backyard target without the need of binoculars or a telescope. Leonard would quite easily compete with twilight and the effects of being so close to the horizon if this is true. But even at magnitude two or three, that wouldn't quite make it a great comet and wouldn't quite compete with the likes of Neowise last year. But there's one more tale Leonard's tale might tell. Given Leonard's relative location almost directly between the Earth and the Sun, at such a low angle versus the Sun from our vantage point, the tail of Leonard might be considerably more bright than light curves suggest. You might have actually heard about this already regarding Leonard. The dust, gas, and debris in the comet's tail will forward scatter sunlight back to Earth. This would take a typical magnitude 4 comet to as low as 2, or a magnitude 2 comet to as low as 1 or 0, comparable to Neowise at its brightest. So I think either way, even if official estimates are right, this comet probably is worth a watch. This scattering effect is best demonstrated by a cold breath with the sun behind it, or steam rolling up off a dark lake with sunlight behind it. Instead of only light reflected back to Earth, light passing through the comet's tail will have a slightly more direct path to Earth. Again, I have to put a giant asterisk next to everything I'm saying here because comets have and will continue to fool us. So here's a breakdown of photographic and observing opportunities for Comet Leonard. From about December 4th to December 10th, Comet Leonard will appear each morning in the eastern sky before dawn for the Northern Hemisphere. This will be one of the best times to experience the comet with lots of darkness to work with. There will be no moonlight and the comet will be well above the horizon before dawn, out of twilight. During this time, Leonard might brighten from about magnitude five to perhaps as much as magnitude two. If you have a telescope or a fast telephoto lens, at the beginning of December, you can start looking as early as 2 a.m. local time. But with each passing night, Leonard rises a little later in the morning. Look due east and find Arcturus. This will be the brightest star in the east just above the horizon. You'll find Leonard not far away. Use binoculars during the early part of this week to help you find Leonard. The two Two best dates for observing Leonard in total darkness, the 11th and 12th, will be strictly for the northern half of the northern hemisphere. By now, the comet is possibly shining at about magnitude 2, very near its peak. Officially, at the time I'm saying this, it's only supposed to be about magnitude 3.9-ish. But if current trends are realized, and throw in some forward scatter, however, it might be even better than magnitude 2. If so, Leonard should have very little trouble overcoming morning twilight and still be naked eye visible even if the skies aren't all the way dark anymore, and hopefully quite striking in photographs. December 11, find the comet up to a couple hours before sunrise in the east. December 12, you'll find it even lower on the horizon and rising only about an hour before sunrise. For these two days in December, you'll need to get well away from trees and obstacles on your eastern horizon. It will be quite low in the sky. On December 13th, things get a little messy in the morning. If you live in middle latitudes like the US and mainland Europe, Leonard will probably just be washed out by the morning sun. However, northern Canada, Lapland, and other areas far to the north will probably be getting some of the best photos of Leonard now. It'll remain dark just a little longer and allow you to see the comet still in darkness before dawn. But another quirk is happening for locations way up north like Iceland, Lapland, and Alaska. Just after sunset, Leonard will be visible in the western sky just after dark starting in early December. And each night will scoot along the western horizon going north to south. Unfortunately, during this time, the first quarter moon will be high in the sky and a bit of a limiting factor. But if Leonard outperforms expectations, this might not be that big of a deal. I'll just call my shot now and say that someone, or many people up north, might be sharing photos of moonlit, snow-capped peaks, a comet, and northern lights. And I can't wait to see that. But we've got 
one more thing. You'll already have a great excuse to be up before dawn from December 12th to 14th. This is the best meteor shower every year. The Geminids. The further north you are, the better the chances you might catch meteors in your comet view or photos. But everyone on Earth can enjoy this meteor shower, even if you are too far south for Leonard to make an appearance over the horizon. And while Leonard's morning show is beginning to wane, the evening show is beginning for just about everyone else. Again, moonlight and twilight will be a limiting factor here to different degrees. In middle northern latitudes starting at around December 11, Leonard will be setting just after the sun does. Soon, it won't be visible in the far north at all, however, as Leonard is now dropping below the planets in the solar system. With each day, more and more of the southern hemisphere can also start seeing Leonard just after sunset or an evening twilight. In the northern hemisphere, Leonard will scoot along the southwest horizon from west to south while in the southern hemisphere, Leonard will appear to just quickly jump off the horizon from night to night, each night climbing higher and higher in the sky after sunset. By December 16th or 17th, depending on how far south of the equator you are, you should be able to view the comet with no twilight at all, but instead with a waxing gibbous moon, beginning to interfere quite heavily instead. And finally, fighting a full moon December 18th. If Comet Leonard continues to put on a good show after this and remain magnitude 3 or higher for any amount of time during December 21st and beyond, then the Southern Hemisphere might get to enjoy Leonard high in the western sky, well after dark, and briefly without moon interference, well above the constellation Sagittarius. In most of the Northern Hemisphere, Leonard remains frustratingly low on the southwest horizon during this time, but your view improves the further south you are. Anyone north of about the Canadian border or north of Paris or Prague won't have much of a view at all for most of this time, while places further south like Mexico or India will have a fantastic view, not too unlike what is happening in the Southern Hemisphere. But for the 21st and beyond, Comet Leonard can be photographed in total moonless darkness. This might be one of the best times for comet astrophotography of Leonard, almost regardless of how it performs short of breaking up before that at least. Photographically, try tracked long exposures when the comet is in full darkness to capture far-reaching details in the comet's tail, wide-angle lenses for landscape shots, and telephotos for beauty portraits of the comet. Way up north, while still visible, try to use moonlight to your advantage to illuminate the landscape. While the comet stays low to the horizon, let the twilight glow become part of the scene. Low distant mountain ranges or abandoned buildings can make for fun opportunities. Keep in mind the higher up you go in altitude, the less light scatters. Light pollution is less severe, horizons are more clear, and twilight less of a problem. Just don't go driving into any mountain blizzards, please. And then finally, mark your calendars for three evenings in particular, December 16th through 18th. During this time frame, Leonard will be elegantly close to Venus, just a couple of degrees away. In fact, it's possible Venus will even appear to be inside the tail of Leonard as it passes by. One thing I regret is that Leonard will pass directly over the Eagle Nebula from our perspective on Earth on the 14th of December. Unfortunately, there's not an easy place or way to get a really good set of photographs out of this encounter. Either too much moonlight, too much twilight, or too much atmosphere. So low to the horizon to get a good clean and sharp photo. But a mountaintop observatory or a space-based telescope might be able to pull off some sort of picture-perfect encounter between the Eagle Nebula and Leonard. I can't wait to find out what the experts pull out for this pairing. And yes, if Leonard holds itself together, we may have another Christmas comet. In northern skies, just look for Venus and Saturn in the southwest. Leonard will have faded considerably at this point, but you'll hopefully find a fuzzy patch forming a nice equilateral triangle with these two planets. If you are too far north, however, such as London, the comet will have already set and probably won't be visible at any point. In the southern hemisphere, look for a different triangle, this time with Jupiter and Saturn. Again, Leonard as a fuzzy patch forming an equilateral triangle with this pair. In many ways, if Leonard holds itself together, this is the whole world's comet. It's not just for the north, like Neowise, and it's not just for the south, like McNaught. So cross your fingers. If Leonard does do well, I'll have plenty of time lapses and captures to share. In the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter and I'll show off my progress and share your shots with me as well. We've chatted about Leonard even before the comet got an official name on my Discord. The link to my Discord server is in the pinned comment. Or for now, check out all my Neowise photos and time lapses. And don't forget my two videos about Comet Atlas Y4 if you want to see all the things that can go wrong and how much fun I can have with that. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, check out my channel page for a wide range of outdoor and out-of-this-world content. Until the next one, I'll see you out there.